Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, ES 2015, and uh, I don't know if I should be using the mic. Uh, I'm going to talk about ES 2015, and uh, obviously there are a lot of things that go into it, so I'm, I'm not able to cover everything. I'm just going to cover some of the highlights. Um, but it's kind of be, going to be kind of a primer to uh, some of the stuff that uh, Jeff and James will talk about in their next talks. Um, and that's why I'm going first instead of last, as the schedule said. So if, if you're not already using ES2015 right now, you most likely will be shortly. And that's mainly because all of the major frameworks are uh, adopting these technologies, these new technologies as part of JavaScript, uh, mostly using transpilers, but the browsers are actually um, very, very quickly adopting these features as well. Uh, very, like, at unprecedented speed, uh, they're adopting them. So ES2015, some of you may know it by a slightly different name, ES Next, Harmony, or the, probably the more popular one, ES6, which is the most latest name uh, going to it. And uh, I can't go into the long story about why there's different names, but basically it's more of a progression when they originally started. Um, they had different goals in mind, and, and eventually they decided that uh, instead of trying to version it by just a, an arbitrary number that increments every time and releases it at, at some arbitrary date, they're instead going to do every single year, they're going to say, boom, we're, anything that, that is ready is cut, and they're going to name it based off of the year. So ES 2015, ES 2016, 17, 18, 19, etc. And in doing so, it puts pressure on them to, to get features out at, at a specific timeline and, and at the same time also makes it on some features they're not quite sure about. They can, they, can, uh, they can easily say, you know, we should wait for now because there's always next year. We can do it in one year. We don't have to wait another four or five or even seven years um, to get it into a release, uh, which was some of the reasons why ES4 uh, uh, took so long, and uh, if, if any of you have done Action Skip 3, that's effectively ES4, uh, but then it was eventually abandoned just because it was just taking too long, and there was too much bureaucracy, and uh, they couldn't come to a compromise. So the new system, they believe, um, and I also believe as well, uh, will work out a lot better. So what are, uh, what are some of the new features? Uh, the, I, this is a pretty huge list, so I, don't, uh, I doubt you can probably read them, but uh, there's a lot of new features. That's the point of this, is there's a lot of changes. It's been a long time coming uh, to finally get some of these uh, most wanted features that we've wanted for over 10 years um, in the language. And when I originally started seeing some of these things pop up in, in uh, TC39, the organization that uh, does the specifications, I, uh, I got pretty, pretty damn excited. Um, and instead of trying to explain how excited, I thought I'd show you this. <laughs> so that's basically my feeling, and uh, th there's actually audio. If you uh, Google uh, cat transcendence, you'll find this, and the audio is actually the best part of it, which is, unfortunately didn't play, but um, I highly recommend cat transcendence. It's, it's good. So who am I? I'm, uh, I'm Jay Phelps. I'm a uh, software engineer over at Netflix, um, and uh, you can find me at underscore J Phelps on Twitter. The uh, regular J Phelps is a 16-year-old uh, boy who likes to retweet football stuff. So if you like football, I follow him. Uh, if you like tech stuff, follow me. Um, and I love uh, some of the some of the things that I love is I love code, and I hate condiments, which is weird, but it's it uh, it stuck several years ago. Um, and then uh, I also love compilers. So if you uh, want to nerd out about compilers, please, please tweet me about them and let's talk. So let's get started. Um, a feature that's probably the most obvious for them to add is block scope. And, uh, and uh, so right now, in the previous versions of JavaScript, you declare variables using the var keyword. And if you've written, uh, if you've written code in any other C style language, um, you'll, this is, you'll quickly find out that the semantics of function scoping, which is what JavaScript had, um, is, is very different. So basically, it, basically, the TLDR is that where you, where you assign a variable, it will be within that scope up until where the function body is. So there's the, the function body block, which are the two curly braces, uh, uh, basically uh, dividing the function body. When I, when I declare x in there, X is available anywhere inside of that body and inside any scopes you nest inside of that. Now the trick comes is that it's only, it all, that uh, new scope creation only happens 
when you create a function. It's function scoped. So when you have a, uh, a block for a, an if conditional, like we have in this example, it does not create a new scope using the var keyword. So when I say var x equals two, what actually is happening is you're reassigning the x from the parent scope, from that function scope, to, to, to two. So that probably, in this, in this case, probably was an accident. I mean, why would you say var when you don't, like you're trying to redeclare it, but in actuality you're not doing that, you're just changing the value. So this, this type of thing has led to a lot of bugs, and uh, there's whole tools around uh, preventing these type of scenarios, particularly linters. If you, uh, if you don't use a lint, um, a lint software or plugin right now, I highly recommend it. Um, basically, it's code, code sanity and code quality. It, you, you have uniform rules. So like, for example, a lint rule would catch this and say, yeah, you can't do that. You're, you're defining, you're redefining the exact same variable in JavaScript will, will not do what you expect. Now, in ES 2015, they introduced a new keyword called let. And let has block scope semantics. So if you've written C, you've written C++, Java, Ruby, you name it, any of the Perl, they all have block scope semantics, and this does too now. So when I declare let, uh, excuse me, when I do let x equals two inside of my uh, conditional block, it does not overwrite the x value in the parent uh, function scope. So this lets us have what we would normally expect, especially if you went to like a computer science school and you didn't learn anything about JavaScript, they just they pounded C into your head. Uh, there's a lot of patterns that you'd bring into here and unknowingly create bugs. And, they're, and sometimes they're really hard to, to uh, track down because you're sitting there saying, I redeclared this variable, you know, why is, why is it leaking out? That doesn't even make sense. And so let was introduced for that reason. Um, here's another really popular example when you're doing for loops, you, you have to declare the, the, the initial value to zero. Um, when, when you use a var instead of let, you're actually leaking that declaration to the parent scope. So that I would actually be available. And if you, uh, if you had declared I above that somewhere, you would be unknowingly blowing away that value and replacing it. But using let, as you can see, if you try to access the I that you declared inside the, the for scope, um, it's not accessible because it's only inside the block, inside your uh, for loop block. So that means var you can effectively completely kill off. You can just say goodbye to var when you start when you start using ES 2015. There really isn't any reason to to use it anymore if you're using these features. There's another block scope uh, feature that they added called constants, which, uh, as you can probably guess, just means that they're constant, that they are immutable or read only, whatever you want to call it. And so once you assign them, they cannot be changed. And here are just some very common examples of uh, demoing that behavior. Here I try to reassign A, it throws an error. I try to uh, define foo without an actual initializer, without a value, throws an error. Um, try to reassign my object, throws an error. Now, it does not make the entire, whatever you assign to that variable, it does not make the entire thing immutable. So if you've got an object, and you just, like here, we've got my object equals an object, a, a pojo. If, uh, if I try and change one of the keys on the object, it won't throw an error, because again, it does not freeze the entire object. Now there, there is a, a method, there's object freeze, so you can actually prevent uh, mutation of any of those properties on that object, but that's uh, not related to this uh, constant mechanism. Um, some people do uh, prefer immutability as a default, like immutable, immutability for everything. Uh, I'm one of, kind of one of those people, like it's fairly new to me, uh, not immutability, but doing this type of pattern. But uh, one pattern that people like to do is actually declare all of their variables constant, uh, and then only change it to let when they actually need to, to change that variable. And this is very, if you come from a C background, it's very weird, because most C people didn't used to do this. But I've actually found in practice, and, and the people I've worked with uh, as well, that this helps us reason about the code easier. And if you're going down some huge block of code, as you see a variable defined, if it is defined as a constant, you know, assuming the code actually runs, that without a doubt, no one reassigns that variable. And so you, you, you can follow the code much easier because if you, if you have some big block of code and you go three-fourths of the way down and you see a variable, you have to kind of backtrack to see where's, where was this redefined or where was it defined. And so if you define it as a constant by default 
and only change it when you need to mutate it. It can help um, your code readability. It can also help in uh, kind of hint at some best practices as well as far as do I really, should I really be mutating this, this variable? Uh, particularly like, uh, you know, if you have a variable that says like my awesome object and you assign it to a string and then later in the function you assign it to a number. Like you just basically, just, you basically broke uh, type rules basically. If, if this was a strongly typed language, you would not be able to do that. You can't say that a string is now a number unless, unless it had implicit casting involved. Um, so again, personal preference. Some people like it. I do know several people who really staunchly hate it. Um, but I haven't heard any good arguments against why they hate it. And so if you have one, please, I actually do really am interested. I want you to find faults in that, uh, in that use case. So, so browser support. Now I'm not talking about transpilers. I'm talking native browser support. You can just type this into your browser and load it up and it'll just work. Um, Edge uh, has support in version 12 which uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, Edge is Microsoft's new browser. Um, it's, uh, I'm not quite sure, I've, I don't follow it enough to know whether it's actually going to replace Internet Explorer or just go alongside. The last time I, last time I checked, it was supposed to go alongside for a little while. Um, Internet Explorer is not gonna be on any of these, by the way, because it doesn't support any of these. <laughs> go figure. But, uh, so Edge, Edge at 12, Chrome at 41, uh, Firefox at 44, and Safari, nope. Um, and uh, you'll start to see a pattern here that Safari has basically become the new IE as far as uh, <laughs> behind the things. So. Destructuring, that's another feature. And uh, it, it's one that I have gotten pretty addicted to. It's, it, it's one where I, whenever I have to write code that is not ES 2015, I, I do end up finding and being like, ah, darn it. Um, so what is destructuring? It's basically a way of just doing shorthand assignment. It's just Type, mainly just type less characters. And so here's two different examples. I, uh, I've got a, uh, an array at the top and then an object at the bottom. Let's look at the first example. We, we have an array of, of one, two, three, and uh, we, what we want to do is get the first and the third item in those arrays and assign it to, to the uh, A and B variables. Easy enough, this code is, you know, it's not, it's not horrible. This is probably all code you guys are very much used to. And then the second example, we've got an object and we want to get the first property, uh, the, literally the, the property named first, um, and assign that to a variable called first, and then we want to do the exact same thing for third. This, I'd say the second pattern is probably the most common. You see it all the time, this type of thing. Well, with destructuring, you can type a little less code. And when you first see it, if you've never written destructuring in any other language, it may feel a little weird. I, I know I did. When I first saw it, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to really grok this and really understand it. But I came to understand it and then came to be very just attached to it and loving it. Um, and so you can see that here I'm able to, to get the first and third item in that array with a similar syntax to how you would actually declare an array, like actually creating an, ob uh, an array literal. But, um, and, but in this case, it doesn't actually create an array. You're basically just saying, you're kind of it's kind of like a pattern match. You're saying, this is what the array looks like, and I'm using variables as placeholders for the values that I actually want. Um, the same thing goes for the object. You basically, you're basically kind of defining the type, the structure that you're trying to take out, hence destructuring. So you're saying that, you, that it's an object, and it's got properties first and third, and those are the ones you want. And so it, within that scope, you can see in the comment there below that if you tried to access first, it would equal one. If you tried to access third, it would equal three. So um, destructuring can also be used um, for uh, swapping variables in an array. Uh, this is something that I don't, I, I can't think of any time I mean, maybe, maybe some bitmap stuff that I've done on Canvas where I would have swapped stuff, but for the most part, I, this isn't a common thing, but it is kind of a neat trick. Um, if you were, let's say you've got an array, you've got B an array with B in the first slot and, and A in the second one, and you want to swap them, you know, and, uh, you could just call it reverse, obviously, and, and they would reverse them. But if you didn't want to call reverse, you didn't want to do a functionification, maybe this is a really expensive, like this is in a hot path and it happens a lot. So you don't want to call reverse because the function invocation would cost too much. Um, you can actually swap them now using destructuring, and you'll notice that there is no, uh, no var ahead of it, no let ahead of it, because you're not 
um, you're not creating a new variable. You don't want you don't want any new variables. You just want to swap them in place. And if you didn't have this syntax to do the swapping, you'd have to have one intermediate variable. Because because remember, you want to take these two items and you want to swap them. So you have to take one of them out of the equation, store it on a variable, and then move the other one, and then put this one back. Because obviously, when you move the other one, you 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 overriding the one on the on the uh, the right, your right, my left. Um, so this allows you to do it without an intermediate variable. Again, kind of sugar, kind of nice. Will you ever use it? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but you can also destructure parameters. Uh, here is a, a helper function called Ajax, um, similar to like a jQuery Ajax, but maybe you wrote your own, where uh, it takes a POJO, a plain old JavaScript <coughs> object, and it, it, the reason why it takes a POJO is, is mainly as like a named parameters uh, kind of hack. And so, so, because let's say there's a lot of different parameters and you don't want this really long parameter list that you, you lose track of which, which, uh, which order they go in, and et cetera. Um, and so this is the traditional way of doing it. You get, you, you get your options hash and then you want to pull out the URL, pull out the method. Uh, with destructuring, you can actually destructure right in the parameter itself. You don't even have to have that intermediary. You can just say, all I care about is the URL and the method. And so you can effectively kind of create named uh, parameters. Um, now, I will. this seems really powerful, and it can get this particular use of it, using it in parameters, uh, for me was very addicting at first, but I found myself overusing it a lot. And what I mean by overusing it is that when you, when you do this, you lose some of the self-documenting nature of your code. When you have a parameter and you call it options, that's a little ambiguous, so I would say options is fine. But it, let's say you've got um, a, a method that takes, takes an argument that the variable name is, is a descriptive name. It's the name of like a type or a person. Like let's say the, the, the parameter name is person. But if you just destructure it, instead of naming it person, you no longer know what type it is. So when you come back to that code or someone else comes back to that code, it's not immediately obvious what it is that it, people are expecting to pass in. Now, maybe you document your code with uh, JS doc, maybe you use TypeScript. Like if you had either of those, that solves that problem. But for the most part, I'll, I have been a part of a lot of code that doesn't do either of those things. And so uh, once you've removed that parameter name, you've lost that self-documenting nature. And I found it really handy. I found myself constantly going back and going, what the hell was that argument? I don't even know. I, I, you can't, sometimes you can determine it, sometimes you can't. So, word of warning, use it, use it wisely. Support on this one is fairly good, again, across the board. Uh, Firefox actually notably has had, has had basic support for this since 22. Um, Safari again, nothing. And, uh, and when I say Safari, no, that's including Safari 9, which has yet to be released, um, as far as their publicly announced feature set. They have announced some things, which I'll get to, um, but publicly they have, announced, they have not announced that destructuring will be part of uh, Safari 9. So error functions. Uh, how many people here have used CoffeeScript? Okay, good chunk, okay. So uh, this is probably a welcome addition if you're a big CoffeeScript fan. Um, it's uh, very similar to, to just shorthand syntax for a function, but there are some rules. There are some rules that make it differ from regular functions, and you do have to really pay attention to those rules, because uh, you can't just always use uh, arrow functions. They might, might not work how you expect. So let's take a, a, a simple example. We've got an array of one, two, three, four, and we want to map it. We basically just wanted to take, we we'll call uh, math power to, uh, to every one of those and just get the results back. Very simple. But we can write this even shorter with the arrow functions. We, instead of using the function keyword and then having the, the parentheses to put your parameters in, you can just put the parameter D, a fat arrow, which is uh, the equals and then uh, uh, greater than sign. And then the, as you can see, there's no actual return statement. There's no return keyword. And when you use this syntax, it is an, it is an implicit return which is very similar to how CoffeeScript worked. Um, it's very similar to how Rust works, if you guys are, if you have any Rust people in the room. Um, and so you, it's, it's a much more terse syntax, and, and uh, it's particularly good for array operations like this. Map, filter, reduce. Um, if you're an RxJS, RxJS person, this type of stuff is, is greatly reduces the amount of code you have to write. It makes it much more easier and terse to read. 
um, and I highly recommend it. Now there is, here's uh, all three uh, examples side by side. You can see the last one. You can still use curly braces if you want to. And when you do that, when you opt into using curly braces, you do have to have a return. Or if you, yeah, obviously, if you want a return. If you don't want a return, then don't return. But uh, you basically get that, uh, those, func those uh, similar behavior that you would. So you, can, you have a scope inside there. So you could say, you could create variables or do any kind of manipulation work that you want to do uh, inside there. Now go, getting into some of the rules, like how these differ uh, than regular functions, lexical this is probably one of the biggest ones that you, you'll come across. And this is an, it's not a quirk, it's an intentional feature. And that's, in this example, it's a contrived example, but it's a, it's a simplified version of what you very commonly have to do in JavaScript because a lot of things are asynchronous. You, you'll, have some, you'll have some scope, like this person function that'll be executed, where inside of an asynchronous callback, you want access to that, to that scope. You want to say this. You want access to the context of uh, the person. And so a lot of people do is they assign it to a local variable. In this case, I, I chose person, but you, uh, a lot of people use that or self. I, by the way, if you still do this pattern, I do highly recommend using something more descriptive than that or self, because what happens when you have multiple layers deep? That, 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 this, 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 self, self, self. You know, you just have lots of selves, and then you're just like, I don't know which self it is. Just name it. You name it what it is. It is a person, so name it person. And I, I found that pattern to really, be really well. So this is the common pattern, but using arrow functions, we can actually just do this. We can access the this inside of the arrow function without saving it anywhere. And that's because the, the, this keyword is bound to the parent scope, the parent function scope. So inside of when your when you're, uh, arrow function is being invoked, it does not have its own this keyword. There is no way to access the this keyword um, inside of it. And that's a benefit. It's so when you're basically doing uh, like set to interval or element callbacks or uh, if you're a React person, you do lots of callbacks, those type of things, you don't really usually want access to this of the actual uh, arrow function. You want access to the parent this. And that's what uh, uh, arrow functions give you. The other thing is they, they also have lexical arguments, which is basically the exact same rule but applied to the arguments keyword. So in this example, when I call main and uh, call, call the uh, arrow function get first argument, it is not getting the first argument of the arrow function invocation, it's getting the first argument of the, of the main function, the parent scope. Um, once you get used to those rules, it, it's uh, fairly straightforward. I mean, I've seen a couple people when they first start off trip over that, um, you know, because it, it's, if, if you're not used to seeing arrow functions in your code, like if you just, if you haven't gotten to the matrix point, you know, where you're just like, I don't even see the code, I just see, you know, the app, I see it all. Um, it, it might be a little weird at first, but I, I guarantee you'll get used to it. The browsers are really stepping it up. There was a long time where new some new feature would come and they would just, not, not usually with, uh, with JavaScript itself, but usually HTML specific uh, additions, and they would just take forever to, to, to upgrade, but not anymore, they're, they're at an arms race. And I have to give props to Edge and the Microsoft people. Um, you know, the days of bashing Microsoft for their browser, in my opinion, are pretty much over. Uh, they, they're doing some really, really kick-ass things. Now you can still make fun of Internet Explorer, by all means, um, but Edge is a, is a whole new beast, and it's it's quite impressive. They're kicking everyone else's butt when it comes to this ES6, uh, excuse me, ES 2015 uh, stuff. So Firefox has been around since uh, two, uh, version 22, Chrome on uh, 45, Safari, still not. Classes. Now this is one of my personal favorites, mostly because in the last I don't know eight years or so. Every framework basically invented their own paradigm of classes, uh, mainly because the, the semantics of prototype-based inheritance is difficult to grasp for a lot of people, even people who are really advanced. Um, so they create that class paradigm that people are so familiar with from their computer science backgrounds to mask over that. So this is like if you wanted a JavaScript class before ES 2015, this is effectively what you'd have to write. It's a lot of code, you don't have to read it all, but the big gist of it is it's 
it's awkward. It's, it's not pretty, it's awkward. There's a lot of redundant things, a lot of things you have to do very manually, and it's error prone if you forget something. If you forget something minor, not anymore. Now you've got a first class class syntax, <laughs> and it looks very much like what you'd see in, in, in C++, in Java, in any of the languages that have uh, classical OO, um, but it is important to remember that this is just syntactic sugar. It still does use prototype-based inheritance under the hood. In reality, it actually transpiles, like if you're using a transpiler, it'll end up transpiling something very similar to this. Um, it's actually more code, I'm not gonna show it because to be compliant with the spec, there's some, there's a lot of code that has to go in to make for make sure for compliance. Edge cases to do with calling super and, and uh, various other things like that. So, but generally speaking, it's just syntactic sugar. So some of the new rules when you're dealing with classes is that you must use new. You must use the new keyword, which means when you de declare class, nowhere, anywhere can you invoke that class name as a function. If you do, it will throw a type error, an exception, which is different than like a historical function where you, where you, where you used to be able to do like, uh, you know, checks like, oh, did this person invoke me as a function versus did it invoke me as a, as a uh, with a new, like, so you do, do two different things. Can't do that with classes. It has to be invoked with new. And that's how you would change it. Classes are not hoisted. Uh, this is something that a lot of people I've noticed actually don't even know about regular JavaScript functions, is that when you declare a JavaScript function as a function declaration, which just means you say, just like this example, you say function square, that's a, a declaration, it actually is hoisted. And you can think of it kind of as, it doesn't work this way, but you can think of it as the compiler goes through and checks for function declarations first before looking at anything else, and then puts those at the top of the file and says, they're ready. And now I'm gonna go back to the beginning and start reading the rest of your scripts. Mm -hmm. And so that means in this case, you can declare square at the bottom of the file, but call it at the top of the file and it still works. Classes on the other hand, are not that way. When you declare a class, it has to be declared before you use it, as in top down <laughs> line number declared. And so it will not be hoisted up. This example just demonstrates that it will throw an error. So to fix that, you have to move the invocation below it. Just like functions, there instead of a function uh, class, excuse me, instead of a class declaration, you can do a class expression, uh, which is works very similar to how a function does. You can you can say you know var or constant or let polygon equals, and then the class expression. And just like a function, if you give the class a name, that name is private to within the, the class's scope. So it does not leak out. So in this example, I demo that by having an internal class, or excuse me, an internal method called get class name, and it looks up using the private name, the polygon internal. But if I try to access polygon internal outside of that, it throws an exception because it did not leak to, uh, to the parent scope. And you, you, uh, you can also uh, do class expressions anonymously, just like you can do functions anonymously as well. You don't have to give it a name. And probably one of the more strange seeming rule is that you have to call super before accessing this in your constructor. And this, this only applies when you're extending, when you're using inheritance. So if you, if you say derived, extends, base, you have to call super before you even touch this, the, the keyword this. And there's a lot of reasons why, but the, but the simplest thing is that if you try, if you've got square and it extends polygon, and you try to access this and, and assign name square before you've called super, the parent constructor has not yet been called. And so because this is prototype-based inheritance, they have not yet, under the hood, created a new instance or new reference for you of, of the, uh, the uh, base class's uh, prototype. So the, the class is not yet initialized. And there's talk about, basically they decided to, to make it the most strict for the initial version and then they may relax this qualification down the road once they really decide, is it really possible? Can we do this in a safe way? Can we have the guarantees that people want? 
Um, so for the most part, it's not going to be an issue, but there'll probably be one or two times where you'll structure your class in a certain way and need and feel like you need to access this before you call super. You need to do something with this. And uh, that's not the right way to do it, and you won't be able to. So you have to uh, restructure your code so that super is always called before this. Now that doesn't mean super has to be the first line in your constructor. It just means you cannot use the this keyword anywhere until you call call, call super. Uh, now one of, the, one of the last things you can do with classes that I'm going to talk about is you can extend native built-in constructors and classes. And this is something that I have personally wanted for a very, very long time. And there are lots of libraries that you probably use that would love this feature as well. Lodash, underscore, these type of things. They're all, there are times where you want the built-in default behavior and you want to extend it in some way. So in this example, we've got a custom array and extends the native built-in array. And you want to add a, a flatten method. Now maybe you want to add a bunch of other ones that, uh, like Lodash has, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 different operations you can do on arrays that are not coming with it. Maybe you want to add that as part of an actual prototype. Now, back in, back in the older days, in the prototype.js framework type of days, it would just extend the native prototype and everyone would inherit it, which uh, is a, tramples over other one, everyone else's choices and causes buggy behaviors. Uh, so this kind of gives us the holy grail of that type of thing. You can create uh, your own arrays and it acts just like a regular array. You can add items to it and push items and the length property magically updates. You can use the bracket syntax that, uh, that you can't use with any other, uh, there isn't any other, this is a very special behavior that's done under the hood and you can now inherit that. Now, one little problem is that then why this isn't popular today well, you haven't even, I haven't even seen this be used anywhere, is that it doesn't, it requires the browser to actually support ES 2015. Okay. It actually <laughs> requires the browser to support ES 2015, which uh, up until re very recently most browsers haven't. So it, using transpilers alone will not fix this. There are no polyfills that can, that can access this magic behind the scenes. So, but that being said, uh, on Edge, you can get it behind a, a feature flag. Chrome is coming soon uh, on 49, which comes out in March. And then uh, Firefox, it has basic support since 2. Yes, 2. It's been able to do all this. Um, but full support is actually coming in 34. Safari, finally, Safari has one feature. They have classes. Uh, they support it in 7.1 and then full support in 9. So how can I play today with all these things? I'm talking about, brow I've been talking about browser support. Most of you probably have to support browsers that are a little bit older than that. I know I do. Um, so what most people do is they use a transpiler, which uh, James will talk a little bit about uh, one of the transpiler options, Babel, which is probably the most popular. Um, but TypeScript, which used to be kind of boutique has become really quick. It's rocketed up into uh, you know, arguably second place. <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Uh, I love both, they have different merits. Basically TypeScript, if, if you like types, if you like strongly typed languages, you'll love TypeScript. It does a really great job of it, and it's just getting better. Highly recommend it. Uh, Babel also is, is a great tool. So, uh, oh yeah, using a transpiler, this is like some, some uh, basic example that we used at the very beginning for a class. Um, this is what a transpiled out output would look like if, when, once you've transpiled it. So there's a lot of gobbledygook, but it's fairly readable. Uh, it aims to be, to be uh, tech compliant. So that's all I have for the ES uh, 2015 stuff. There's a lot of stuff to talk about, so I can't talk about it all. But let's, let's gossip for just a little bit. I love gossip. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, rumored features in uh, ES 2017 or plus plus or you know someday maybe. But uh, I do want to give a little disclaimer. I don't know what I'm talking about. Not on TC39. Uh, the, you know, I probably will get yelled at for talking about these features even because they're, they're pipe dreams at this point. They're not, as far as I know, again, I, I don't go to TC39, so I don't know yet. But as far as I know, they're not even stage zero. They're just a pipe dream. So enums is something that, that uh, one of the TC39 members wants to add. And I'm going to very briefly just show you, if you're familiar with enums, there's nothing really to learn. They're enums. So it's, it's exactly how you would expect an enum to work. 
So you can say, basically, why would you use an enum when you don't really care, where, where you need types, but you don't really care what the underlying value is. They're not assigned some string or number, they're just arbitrary, but you still need the types. So this example with colors, that's a common one. Um, any kind of flags is another common one. And you can, uh, you can take a look at that. I'll publish my slides so you can actually, because you can't click on a link through a projector, but uh, I'll publish my slides so you can get that link. Um, and last but not least, pattern matching. This is my, like, oh my god, I've been advocating for this forever. Really excited about this one. Um, and Yehuda kind of spilled the beans to me about his little pet project on this. And this isn't a final syntax, so it's, but it's just a thrown together idea of what it might look like. And if you're used to Rust or some of the older languages actually, like Haskell and some of these other ones, they, they have similar pattern matching type of things. Um, they basically want to extend the switch statement to make it much more smart. Right now, when you say switch, you say case something and it gets cast to a string regardless. Um, they want to be able to do all sorts of fancy things, destructuring and checking for types and uh, be able to do a lot of really powerful things. When you look at this example, it's showing every way you could possibly use it, which isn't a very good example because it looks ridiculous. But in the real world, it becomes very powerful and you have a lot. Basically, you can reduce the amount of code you have and especially nested if statements. You got if this, if that, if, if else, this, and all this crazy stuff, checking the types, you can do very quick syntax. So um, if you want to get, there isn't any spec written up on this. Again, it's just mostly conjecture at this point. Uh, but if you want to get a taste of, of what it will be like, there's a project called Sparkler which uh, runs using Sweet.js that you can get a taste of this syntax today in JavaScript. Uh, it's not compatible with Babel or any of the other transpilers because of parser conflicts, but it's what it is. Um, little bonus guesses. Um, there's been forever talks of optional type annotations similar to, to ES, ES4 back in the day when it was shelved, but now with Flow and TypeScript actually proving it out and, and leading the way on that, it might become a serious consideration. Uh, macros is also something that I, I uh, have heard uh, in a couple of the meetings that I've sat in that have completely come up again. And there's there's a lot of people that don't like them, um, but it's what it is. And if you want to check out macros today in JavaScript, uh, check out Sweet.js, which is great. And the last thing I want to say is that your voice matters to these to these people who are writing the spec and to the people in the community who care about this. Please do uh, uh, have a voice. Tell them what, why you don't like something, tell them why you love something, tell them why you want something. So if there's a feature you think that JavaScript is missing, voice it. Um, it definitely helps if, if you know what you're talking about to some extent, but you don't have to. I mean, even just spitballing ideas, some of the best ideas have come up with just casual conversations of, hey, this other language has this, why, you know, why don't why doesn't JavaScript have that? Um, and you know, it gets people talking and thinking. So um, please do. Talk to your TC39 people. There are a lot of them, especially you guys are so lucky we live in the Bay. There's uh, so many of them here that you can just walk up and, and uh, talk to. So that's all I have. Thank you guys.